What up, world? It's Mac. Tell me something slick and make it stick. Yes, sir. You know what that means. You know, God damn it, what this is. This is the fourth time. This is the fourth installment for the state of hip hop, past, present, and future with mm-hmm. my guy, my brother, my DC dog, the mm-hmm. musical savant. The one that, man, I said, you know what? I'm going to have to get his ass in the harbor to teach this shit one day. We're going to get that done. <laughs> There's none better, none greater than my brother, Mr. B. Cox, in the building. How you been, sir? I'm good, man. I'm good. Glad to be back, brother, Mac. Glad to be back in Cigar Chats with Mac once again. Yes, sir. I appreciate you, man. I'm ready to get this thing going and going, man. I appreciate you having me once again. Yes, sir. Well, absolutely. Well, listen, y'all. Only a few things is this good for the fourth time. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Now, hit that like button. Go ahead and subscribe because this is the last treat for the quarter. We're mm. we giving y'all some food for the quarter. All right? So sit back, sit tight. We'll see y'all in a second, baby. Be Cox and Mac. We'll be back. Welcome back, everyone. Well, listen, B. Cock, the last time, you know, man, we, the good thing about what we do, we touch on all regions, all parts of the country. We leave no, we leave no man behind. <laughs> and that's the one thing that people love about us. But I tell you what, as we always do, we always start off with hip hop in the Mecca, where it started from its origins. And then we go on and we, then we and you, we get in the plane and we travel. We on the Mac Cash jet. We're going to hit up some other regions as we move about. Yes, but sir. because let's start and it's perfect time. And I, hey, man, some things are just synchronicity. I want us to start here, man. Now, it's a lot of moguls that, you know, you know, a, a, a again, a, a literally a prisoner of the moment. Of course, we know what's going on with the Diddy allegations. Me and B. Cox spoke about that at nauseum last time. Don't want to go into all of that crap. We had a great take on that before. But yeah. as far as hip hop mogul, you know, saying he was of that ilk and of that cloth, but it was somebody that preceded him that he took the blueprint from. And he everything this guy did, he did and tried to do it in, in more of a, I would say, with a little bit more genesis qua. But when I think of pure scratch entrepreneurs, when I think of the godfather who put hip hop in a whole nother realm, and he gave us one of the greatest MCs ever. B. Cox, let's set the table and let's talk about the great Def Jam, but let's talk about Russell Simmons, man, and, and, and how he gave us and being the progenitor of so many great artists, the LLs and, and, and all of the Def Jam, you know, the legacy. Man, however you want to open yeah. that up, I'm going to allow you to open up, sir. The floor is yours. Yeah, of course, man. And, you know, have to first, before we even get into that, we talked about Diddy and his allegations. It's, it's only right. fair that we talk about you know, Uncle Rush has some things that's plowed in him as well. You know, we all know he's not in the country right now. Right. You know, he's hiding. I mean, some people say he's hiding out um, based on those allegations that he has. So we do have to say, one, we don't condone any of those things that they're no. saying about him. And should they be true? But allegedly, he's had some things accused against him as well. And there's been some pretty salacious things. But we're going to talk about Russell Simmons, the, as you stated, hip hop mogul, record executive, entrepreneur, really visionary. And it starts with Def Jam. And honestly, it doesn't even start just with him. If you're going to talk about Russell Simmons and you're going to talk about Def Jam, okay. you also have to talk about the other guy, another half of the equation that was there, and that's none other than the legendary Rick Rubin. You know, the two of them linking up while Rick Rubin was at NYU. Um, you know, them getting associated. Some people, of course, say, you know, they got linked up uh, by, uh, you know, DJs and a few other people, but they get together to start this record label and they create this record label, which would become Def Jam. Now this to me, Def Jam is the first, I would say became the first urban and also hip hop label that strictly focused on urban and hip hop music. Now in the beginning, a lot of folks don't know 
because of Rick Rubin's background, they also had some rock acts that they had there as well. Um, mm-hmm. that lead to the first couple of signings that made Def Jam really as a legacy and as a label. Def Jam, though, was important for many different reasons. As we stated, of course, it's probably hip hop's first super label. Okay. And it's right at the beginning when hip hop is in coming out of its infancy and getting into its childhood, so to speak. Def Jam gives us, and you know, you can say obviously things about Curtis Blow. We all know Curtis Blow was the first solo rap star right. to have a major label deal with Mercury Records. And he dropped in 1980 and gave us records like The Breaks and you know, became a legend in his own right. But you can say that Def Jam is responsible for giving us hip hop's first breakthrough mainstream mm. solo superstar, mm. and none other than James Todd Smith. Cool J. And let's also take it to the other half of this. Come on, they also give us one of the more pioneering groups in hip hop that you cannot ignore and their work cannot be ignored when we talk about the early days of hip hop during that first decade plus that hip hop was as a genre and in the public consciousness. And that's the beastie boys. And you have to look at that. That's hearkening a lot back to their, their origin and roots was to Rick's rock roots. So you're sort of taking the best of both rush from Queens, LL Cool J from Queens, beastie boys, Jewish guys from Brooklyn, you know, You're taking the sensibilities of both these founders of Def Jam and giving Def Jam their foundation really starting right there. And over that next decade, you saw some game-changing acts come from that label. Talk about the acts that have come through just heading into that first decade of Jeff Def Jam, starting right around 1984. Okay. LL Boys. But then you also have the signing of probably one of the most impactful groups in hip-hop history, Public Enemy. Yes, sir. Then you have other acts that follow afterwards. An act that definitely shook up the scene when they came along with their style. The style of the bald heads and the hardcore music, the yelling, the Tim, the 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 black boots, the hoodies with onyx. You know? Yes, sir. Next decade, you then also get consequential acts that joined the label as a result of their their labels shuttering with EPMD. You know, then you also have Red Man, Method Man, going over to the West Coast and getting an artist like Warren G. Come on now. Stepping into the R&B scene and getting to act like Montel Jordan. Come on. Stepping into the new scene, stepping into the new school and getting to act like Foxy Brown. Ow. And then also, for good measure, pulling in a generational talent and one Earl Simmons, the late great DMX. Ooh. Oh, and by the way, Right around that time when they were getting into that new school of hip hop in the mid to late nineties, they happened to get a partnership with this guy, a couple of guys with a rock and record label that they started. And one of those guys became one of the greatest hip hop artists of all time. A lot of people will say he's definitely got to be within your top two, if not your top five. And that's what Rockefeller records and Jay Z. Come on now. So got other acts coming in to make them relevant, signing an act like Ja Rule. Come I remember on. this is right around the survival of the illest time that tour with DMX having an act like Ja Rule on there as well, when things were really starting to come around. So musically, they started in this when hip-hop was in its childhood, when it matured into preteen and also to their teen years, they're continuing to stay relevant. All this while, you also have LL continuously putting out records during this time. You know, we talked about the, the radios, the bads, Walk with the Panthers. The come on, Mama's gonna knock you out. I need shot, love. Come shot, on, shot the, shot, shot, forty shots to the dome. The come on, Six, phenomenons. But then to be able to get acts like Foxy Brown, then to bring it into Montel Jordan, an act like Case as well in the R and B side. So they're continuing to say relevant when a lot of records during that record labels during that time that were hip hop focused were folding because. They were struggling with distribution, struggling with cash flow, struggling with relevancy. And okay. Def Jam outlasted all of them. That's right. And as a matter of fact, they ended up serving as a blueprint really for a lot of those ables we look in the 90s that started making names for themselves in the bad boys, the death rows, mm. you know, seeing, uh, you know, labels come up like cash money, like no limit, yeah. like special death. You know, rap a lot, all of that. Yeah, yeah. Face. 
mm-hmm. all these different ones. And what it also did was allow for a lot of companies go on to take distribution on with these labels and give them the avenue. Because having a label is one thing. If you back then, if you didn't have distribution, you ain't have nothing. Imagine oh, being the drug dealer and not being able to push your product. That's what distributors do. That's what when you have a Sony Music, when you had back then a CBS Records, when you had a major label that was willing to basically put their stamp and say, we are backing this product for distribution. That's what made it important. Mm -hmm. And you look at what the legacy is of the other pop culture phenomenons that Def Jam brought about. The movie Crush Groove in 1985. Classic. Maple, classic, man. Come on. Classic. Uh, something that introduced us to LL Cool J to a lot of us in the first place. Damn right. You know, Def Comedy Jam. Come on, man. Launching pad for so many great comics that we would see over the next two to three decades. You know, seeing it, the first one being hosted, but the first season being hosted by the likes of none other than Martin Lawrence himself. You know? Yes, sir. Entertainer, Chris Rock, hosting it, seeing acts like Bernie Mac. Come on now. <laughs> Come on, Peacock. Talk your shit. Let's go. But then you go from that. There's Deaf Comedy Jam. Then Deaf Comedy, then Deaf Poetry Slam, you know? And seeing, even while as short lived as it was, how that captured the attention of all these different people. And then this is not showing up on network television, but showing up on HBO, you know? And, and you know, Deaf, Deaf Comedy Jam was bad because when I was coming out, I was in elementary school. I was not supposed to be up watching Def Comedy Jam because they used to get riggedy raw on that thing, boy. Oh, yeah. They used to get riggedy raw. Oh, I was yeah. it was okay letting me watch Comic View, but Def Comedy Jam when I was a kid, no, you're not watching that. That was yeah. one of those things you had to sneak to get up yeah. in the middle of the night and catch the replay to catch it so that you make sure you go to school and talk to everybody else about what happened with Def Comedy Jam. You know, all, all those things and all the other different business ventures aligned with it. Fat Farm Clothing, you know? Yes, All sir. things that are being involved with that, the partnerships that they had with different record labels. We talked about the partnership with Rockefeller that happened right around 1997, 98. Big power move for the label for an upcoming record label and one of the upcoming artists during that time in Jay-Z, which would add more acts later on, which would eventually make Rockefeller a player for the rest of that decade heading into the new millennium. But then you had Rush Associated Labels, which brought on, of course, people like Red Man. You had uh island which became a part of def jam with island def jam the partnership with murder inc which brought ja rule and all the different murder inc offs and ashanti and vita and all those folks right into our consciousness as well i mean the cultural impact of it is absolutely undeniable they really laid the blueprint for the first hip-hop super label for it to be okay to get behind a hip-hop act so people weren't saying Oh, hip hop's just this novelty that's gonna be around for a decade and it's gonna flame out like disco. Like, no, this was here to stay. And Def Def Jam was a big part of that because culturally, what they did for hip hop and the thing centered around their culture of hip hop being in comedy shows, being inside of poetry slams, being with clothing, entertainment abroad, having partnerships that made sure they stay relevant throughout the decade is what made Def Jam so consequential. Because one point on this, let's let, let's just let's just highlight the great LL Cool J really briefly on this before we transition to the next place we're gonna go. Yeah, to. LL, for what he did, he was the first rapper that really made in a poetical way was able to f- really romance these women and talk to them in a way where it, it didn't come off as no sucker shit. It yeah. came off as like you know what, man, I can't be mad at you, James Todd, for that shit. I like that. I'm gonna have to say some of that player shit myself. Yeah. yeah. He, appealed to the ladies in such a, an emotional way but he still was able to walk the fine line was hey man you know what i'm from hey i'm from queens i hey, ain't no ain't no bitch in me don't yeah. try it. mama yeah. said knock your punk ass out and that's what i'm that's what i will do yeah why is it peacock and you cannot answer this in that de- you know and i i say with divinity because you can't speak for everyone Mm-hmm. But you being the music savant that we treasure you to be, how is it that LL, is it because he was so many generations before and a forerunner of his, of, of that era that he, for 10, people tend to forget he was a bad man on that mic? Yeah. Well, uh, let's talk about the beginning. LL joins Def Jam as a teenager, right? Yeah. He's 15, 
I think like close, like maybe maybe 16 years old when he comes out with radio. And that is a classic hip hop album off the break. Now he lyrically and flow wise, he was ahead of his time and ahead of his peers mm-hmm. during that time, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't know. Jay-Z and LL appears, right? They're they're the same <laughs> age. Damn, that is crazy. They are peers. You're right. Age. They're the same age. That's but LL crazy. was so phenomenal, man, because it wasn't just that. You talked about his sensibility with the ladies, man. You know, being a good looking guy doesn't hurt the fact that, and if you I smooth know. and you, you have some game, I yeah, know. that gets the ladies in your corner. But the one thing that folks don't understand, like you said, he was a bad boy on that mic and still is a bad boy on that mic, close to being almost 60, almost 60 years old now. But it was the balance. It was being able to have that way with the ladies, but then also be hard as hell on the mic to get on and do rock the bells. And I need a beat and radio and bad, you know, I mean, like that's the type of things that got people sliced about it, doing booming system, you know, like, and mama going knock you out to the break of dawn, you know, those type of songs. He had the crossover appeal. And that's why I said he was hip hop's first mainstream breakthrough solo superstar with no disrespect to Curtis Blow whatsoever. But he was the first guy that wasn't in a group because hip hop was big on groups when it first started. We talk about all the groups that were out there. You know, uh, watching even Wild Style. You see the, you know, the Furious Five and uh, the Funky Four plus one more um, uh, singing uh, Run DMCs, Treacherous Three. They, everything with hip hop was about groups until they had solo superstars come out. And he was the one who did it because he didn't need the bank it, backing necessarily of a DJ. And he mm-hmm. didn't need the backing of a group in order to do it. He was somebody that can get on the screen by himself or in a video on a track by himself and can captivate you just by what he was saying out of his mouth, his flow, his presence, his charisma, yes, all sir. of that. Yes, sir. He really did lay the blueprint for a lot of guys who came after him, right? You could even look a few years later and seeing a guy like Big Daddy Kane, who had cachet with the ladies, who had some game, but lyrically was nasty, right? It laid the groundwork for guys like that later on to understand, like, hey, you could be a little bit of both. You could be a bad boy in that mic and talk that shit, and you could talk your shit to the ladies, man, and it can go down. Just as long as it ain't on, on you said, it ain't on no sucker shit. So right. you got to love that. But but he was able to do it because he was really ahead of his time, man. Flow-wise, he was doing something um, that a lot of people weren't doing at that time. And lyrically, he was great. And he's kind of always been there. And, ever, and it's the full package. It's the lyrics. It's the flow. It's the presence and performance. He's going to get on. He's going to perform whether he's on record or whether he's on stage. So that has maintained itself because that's a formula that's not going to really die out in hip hop. Styles may change and things may happen. If you could do those things right there, you'll always be relevant. And that's the reason why. And there's some duds here and there that he's had album wise. But for the most part, though, he even said it himself with the latest album project he's putting out with Q-Tip. When he said the last album he put out, when it flopped, he said, you can't be part time in this. You got to be full time. Now, LL's moved on. We know he's now a very accomplished actor, actor, entrepreneur, all the different things that have happened now. So he's not just a kid that was from Queens that was rapping on Def Jam. He's so much more than that now. But as he said, this is what he is first. And you can't be part-time in it. You got to be full-time. I like that, Beacox. Well said. Hip-hop's first real mainstream breakout superstar, man, because to go on from 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 hip hop to I mean the guy did movies he's he's had his own TV shows man much respect to James Todd man and he was the one that was talking that shit to them ladies early on and I'm not gonna lie I got damn it pattern style I took it in my own form man I oh, said yeah. the hell with this <laughs> let me put my hat on I said because let me put my hat on lip my yeah. goddamn lips too yeah <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Mm-hmm. Hey, y'all, it's good to have B-Cox back in the building. All right, B-Cox, mm-hmm. we're in the state right here in New York. Now, this next guy, we touched on him last week, but it wasn't really, I'm sorry, last segment, it wasn't really about him, but you can't talk about Ja Rule. Their careers are intersected without talking about this gentleman here. Yeah. Now, they go hand in hand. You, you, mm-hmm. you, you can't. But the thing with this guy, and with 50 Cent, I'm talking about hip-hop's king troll. Mm-hmm. When I think of a guy like 50 Cent, I think of a guy that says, 
I look at him and I say, you know what? Here's a guy that's never been considered the greatest lyricist, never been considered the greatest rapper. I look at a guy that has sheer determination and grit. I'm going to make it. I'm going to get it no matter what at all costs and be fearless. And as life has moved on and he's, you know, went on and done great things with the stars and, and, and you know, and a show and all of that. Where do you think hip hop will place 50 Cent? What will be his legacy? Because the music, I'm going to be honest, last stuff he dropped, I've heard, I, I wasn't impressed. It ain't, it ain't, it ain't sounding too good. But when he was home and that boy dropped that goddamn Get Rich or Die Trying in 03, B. Cox, the man came through Chicago and we sh- hey, we was all in on 50, on, on, on 50 Cent. We was all in. Yeah. And I remember that yeah. energy, that yeah. hunger. So as you go through his discography, B. Cox, and the major records we got, and we just opposed them briefly to, 50, to Ja Rule last time, where will – how will hip hop's king troll be remembered, man? Will it be for the trolling or will it be for the bars? I think he'll be remembered for the bars. Now, l- let's also caveat with this. All right. F- from the beginning, 50 has been somebody who has been known to walk the line. Like what Charlie Murphy say, habitual line stepper. He's willing to do that, right? Even from the beginning in 99, when Power of a Dollar was supposed to come out and then all the stuff happened with you know, him getting shot and the legal troubles and then the, the label basically not deciding to put out the record. Um, he had beefs. It, the one with Ja, we know, was there. He had beef with Sticky Fingers. He had a very short-lived beef with Jay-Z or tried to pick a short-lived beef with Jay-Z. And then Jay kind of ended it because he had to be a gentleman, which was on the mixtape that he had, you know, uh, that he went after Jay. And then Jay basically ended it with a one bar. And that was, I'm about a dollar with dollar, a who the fuck cents, cents. cent. <laughs> Like, what are we talking about here, bro? <laughs> and then that was the end of that. Um, but he's had other feuds, you know, feuds with Nas. Obviously, yeah. famous one he's had right now with Rick Ross, um, his, within his own label with Game, you know. And, and that's been back and forth for a while. But he's known for all those high-profile feuds. And it's the feuds, not just in the game, but the feuds in life that kind of help make his legacy. Ultimately, what part a big part of his legacy will be is that he's hip hop's one of its biggest perseverance and comeback stories, even before anybody knew who he was. Okay. The fact that the shooting happened and that pretty much added to his legend and legacy that he he walked away from that yeah. and was able to live from that. That and the talent that he had, dropping those mixtapes that he had, getting onto Shady and Aftermath, working with Eminem and Dr. Dre. <laughs> Putting out probably behind Doggy Style, one of the biggest Ooh. debut albums to ever come out. Literally, you look it up, it's Doggy Style and it's Get Rich or Die Trying, Ooh. right? And it was such a big record, such a monster record, Ooh. something that stayed with us for so long that it launched really the careers of at least three to four different other people afterwards. This launched G Unit. I mean, this helped to make some G Unit something that became a hip hop household name as far as a crew. It helped to launch the career of Lloyd Banks and gave us the avenue from Lloyd Banks. It gave us Young Buck. It gave us and let us know who Tony Yayo was. It also opened up the door to show us who the hell game was, right? So what 50 did is what he always did when he was in the streets as a hustler. He basically did what he knows what hustlers do. He hustled and found a way in. He found a way to get that product, took it and flipped it, and then he took it and flipped it again. Then he took it and flipped it again. His career became an opening for G-Unit. G-Unit gave us four big acts that had four, or at least three of them, that had three monster debut albums in The Hunger for More, Straight Out of Cashville, and the documentary. You know, it was huge. His own albums to follow up, Get Rich or Die Trying, The Massacre, and Curtis. You know, big, big records. Big records. And then you under, then people see that, he becomes a little bit more marketable. You get more brand deals coming in through it. Eventually, he starts signing athletes to G-Units, r- coming up with G-Unit shoes, getting the vitamin water deal, which is what basically made him from a, I'm a multimillionaire to I'm, d- I'm damn near in that elite club of people who are wealthy, not just rich, I'm but I'm wealthy. wealthy. Right. And what that has opened up the opportunities for him to do now is look at the things he has done production-wise with, we talk about, you know, Den of Thieves, which was, you know, something that he's involved in production wise. 
all the other things that he's on the movie that he did uh, uh things fall apart the get rich and die trying movie which is basically a biopic you know in in dramatic form mm-hmm. and then there's the power universe which started with an idea and has gotten so big now off of a storyline where it's like okay 50 has done and created something basically all starting from just one seed of this being it the start of his rap career has now made it into where he has his hands in so many different pots now and he's getting into that as we talked about previously L O cool j like mobile type status and being involved in many different things and that's a good thing to have right. now unlike L O cool j the other part of this legacy that 50 has is that he continues to be a petty ass fool. You know? He continues to hold on to things and continues to keep, you know, we're looking for the next thing to provoke. As I say, I wrote down in my notes, he is, you know, when he's gotten involved in ent- entertainment and all this stuff with television and production, it seems as though he went and took the entertaining route as well with the way he wanted to be with his presence online. So now, so he does all this trolling on IG posts and with memes and with comments and videos and going lives, attacking all those people, most of them that I just mentioned as far as who he has beefs with um, yeah. and calls people out and comments on things that obviously he, you know, probably shouldn't have any business commented on, but he's going to do it because he feels like he can, right? And if you get a certain status for 50, you kind of feel like you're kind of untouchable. So you're going to be like, yo, what really can you say about me or do to me? Because here's also the thing about 50 and his trolling, right? Everybody knows you can't out-troll him. No. You can try if you want to, but if you're going to try, you better be ready to play the game and play the long game because he's petty. He's petty as hell, and almost nothing for him is below the belt. He is willing to go just about as low as you think someone can go when it comes to calling people out. I don't see them call out Lizzo. I seen him talk about Melissa Ford. I see him talk about all these different people out there. He'll call folks out, man. So that's got to be his legacy, too. But, yeah, if you right. look at, but if you look at 50 and his origins, all the stuff you talk about with Sticky and with John, all these beefs, man, this is who 50 has been. This is nothing new. <laughs> he is going to put to toe the line and play things the way he wants to play them and see who's going to be willing to, to, to play along with him. And if, like I said, if you're going to try to play, you better be willing to play the long game because one thing we all know about, it, if you're dealing with petty people who don't give a fuck, hey. you already know. You, they, they, they'll ride that bad boy till the wheels fall off. And then even after the wheels fall off, they're going to ride the studs <laughs> and tell them bad boys grind in the dust. They're going to keep going until ain't nothing left to go. That's it. Because my only my only thing with him, man, is like, dude, at some point, let the shit go, man. I mean, yeah. it's like Irv Gotti didn't <laughs> had a stroke and you still fucking with this man. Like, yeah, bro, dude, man. Like, let it go. You won. You yeah. won. <laughs> yeah, federal indictment. He's still comment and it's like, dude, like, stop. You're beating the de- the horse is dead already. Let it go. <laughs> let it go. And so that's but, my only thing yeah. with him. I don't mind a little petty because I got a little bit of that in me too. I don't matter. I, I, I don't matter. You know, my moniker is I'm Petty Paul. Like, come for me. I'm gonna send Petty Paul for you. But at some point, then it becomes, hey man, now this is some other shit. You got now you're going a little bit too far. Mm-hmm. But I agree with Beacock what you said. All hip hop's probably, I guess you could arguably say ultimate hustler. Mm-hmm. It's definitely been that. Yeah. But as well, man, as hip hop's uh king troll. So yeah. All that shit, he, he's the ultimate hustler that trolls you. So I guess that's his complex legacy. But, but to your point, this is nothing new. Yeah. And one last thing I say about 50. Go ahead. Go ahead. Because. 50 is not willing to let go of shit with his son. Yeah. Like he's the oldest one. Then how in the hell do you think he's going to quit with everybody else? <laughs> Damn. I mean, come on now. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> if you drag your son... Yeah. Oh, ain't nobody got a chance, Peacock. Yeah. Well, you know, the only thing Floyd may have got a little bit of him, because remember he's Flo- he told Flo- Floyd told him so he said he'd give him a half a million dollars to Floyd Reed, a cat in a hat. And then Floyd said, I give you a million dollars that you can get your oldest son to tell you that he loves you. <laughs> hey, I don't know. I don't I I don't know who told Floyd to say that, but that was good. <laughs> hey man. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Fifty Cent, man, keep doing what you do, brother. It's great entertainment, but hey, man, it is what it is. All right, Beacox, let's just circle back really quick before we leave. Let's just go back down the hall to the Def Jam building. It's one guy. He's your, he's always when you ask elite MCs who's your top rapper, you can no matter if you ask Method Man, no matter any Eminem, this guy is always and has been putting in work since the nineties. Somehow he's another rapper, another artist that tends to be forgotten. And maybe it's because, hey, man, he likes to live off the grid. He's unassuming. He ain't with all the glitz and glamours. But when it comes to putting up some goddamn bars and mm-hmm. rapping, mm-hmm. you're going to be hard-pressed to rap Reggie No. I'll rap Reggie No. Because let's talk about Red Man. And yeah. He's your favorite MC's favorite MC. Yes, sir. Yeah, man. Reggie, I love Reggie, man. I love him. Um, for 30 years plus, man, he just continues to get the job done. Come on, Pico. As you mentioned, man, he's a work, he's a workman's MC, right? Mm. And what I mean by that is that when it comes to clock in and get down to business with rhyming or performing, he gives it his all all the time. Come on, and, you know, you, you know, you don't see a drop off in his style in those these three decades. No, sir. No drop off in his style or in his skill over that time. No, sir. no shift in his demeanor or his approach. No, sir. You know, no shift in his the way that he dresses or the way that he acts. No, sir. Re- Reggie has been this way since we first saw him pop on the scene in 91, 92. And he has been that way even now in 19 in 2024, man. He is him. He is who he is. And he will continue to stay true to himself. And I think, to me, that's what endears him to a lot of his contemporaries. Okay. And also his immediate successors, meaning the folks that came right after his era and who are all masters of their craft and MCing. And it also what endears him to fans as well, because he ain't about that fake shit. He's going to be him. He's not going to be anybody else. And that's, to me, why I think he's your favorite MC's favorite MC. Because he gets busy and everybody knows that when you get a verse from Rep Man, he's going to go in on those 16 bars. A little bit of comedy, a little bit of this. When it comes to drop a hot 16, Reggie Noble is going to give you his all. And that has not changed in the three decades he's been around. I mean, look at this. Eminem, who a lot of people have as they go on a top five or a top 10, has him first in the list of rappers when he mentions all time greats until I collapse. It goes, Reggie. The first name he says. Tupac? Come on, man. Yeah. 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 That's the first name that he says. And hell, during the versus, the uh, presentation him and Matt did, what did Reggie have? A shirt with that on it. It goes Reggie. <laughs> you know? That's who he was talking about. The consistencies in his project, you know, projects he's put out. The what the album drop in his debut. There is a dark side. Definitely, if you mm. talk to people, especially... Redman, but this is turning 30 years old this year, by the way. There is a dark side. Probably one of his most experimental projects. And if you talk to some Redman fans, probably their favorite. The excellence that is Muddy Waters, right? If I'm classic, that is Muddy Waters. You better stay that, Peacock. Um, Come on. Coming back with Doc's the name, malpractice. It's just the consistency in his projects and the features that he has, the projects with meth. And Red putting out Blackout and then coming back and doing projects together. Them being a dynamic duo as any dynamic duo that aren't actually a group in hip hop. The freestyles that we've seen him drop over these last at least 10 years plus just to let everybody know he still got it. It's all stuff well known by now and things of legend. So Reggie is everybody's favorite MC because when he gets comes to the mic, he gets down and he gets busy and he continuously puts out that effort. And there's something to be said to have a career for 30 years, to not have any drop off in your style, to not change your style up, to not change who you are when you have every reason in the world to do so, but you don't. Mm. And Red Man knows the people that love him and he knows it's what they want. And he's cool with that being his target audience. And if other people don't like it, then, oh, well, that's fine. But that's why Red Man's everybody's favorite MC in their business, man, is because a dude like him gets busy. And for those who get in and put in work in the studio, and put their work into this craft, recognize that about him, and that's the reason why they know this dude plays no games, man. Because I can't say it no better, so I won't. All I'll say, man, I respect consistency uh, of the ball work, 
the image. Yeah. Um, I mean, man, Red Man from uh, MTV Cribs. Yeah, that was oh, yeah, classic. Man. Classic, classic. Hey, man. Everybody who couldn't yeah. relate to that shit. Yeah, relate. The yeah. nigga, did, the nigga, doorbell didn't even work. You had to do the wires, and I mean, just yeah, the relatability with the exactly. damn foreman grill, because that's how I was living at the time with the foreman yeah. grill. <laughs> yeah, exactly, man. That's who he is. That's why we love him because he's real. You know, as real as you can get. Real as you can get. Well said. All right, because we almost out of New York, man, but I got to talk about these guys because of the resurgence that happened when they literally cooked. The, I mean, and they cooked the shit out of Cameron and them in that damn verse. <laughs> and one of my favorite rappers, man. Now, he's not in my top five because mm -hmm. I just can't, I can only put five in there, but he's definitely in my top ten. And that's Jada Kiss. But let's talk about the locks because Styles P is, that's a hell of a pippin to 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 to, uh, to Jada's Jordan. That's a hell of a guy right there, man. And that's no disrespect. Style P is, has really, man, his ball work has consistently like, got better and better. The ghost has definitely improved over the years. Love mm -hmm. me, yeah. Talk about the lock and their legacy because even though when they got with you know they was on Bad Boy for a moment, yeah, but they shook that off. Yeah, and they went over there with Rough Riders and got them and Dean and Watt and them did their thing with them, man. Let's talk about yeah. that, man. Let's talk about the locks, man. Well, you know, with the locks, it's a lot like Rep Man. They're a workman's group. Mm. Nothing spectacular, nothing flashy. Mm. It's working results. That's it. That's all you're getting from them. Individually, they all have their exploits, as you mentioned. Jada, I think to me, became the biggest beneficiary of being in the public's eye, taking that work they did with the locks, building on it. And becoming a phenomenon of his own right. Yes, sir. Um, same thing with Styles P taking yes, that work and really becoming a, a, a phenomenon by his own like Sheik doesn't have the exploits of those two either. But what he is, he's the perfect team player. So when it comes together, you don't have no locks without Sheik being there. You can talk a lot about Jada and a lot about Styles, wow. but it, it ain't no locks without Sheik being there to complete the trio. It's mm -hmm. not, but collectively they are a force and they've been a force now for 25 years after they first burst onto the scene now a lot of people will discount them right because you're not mentioning the locks in your top 10 groups of all time you're not even probably mentioning them in your top 20 group hip-hop groups of all time you're not because based just on their group catalog alone that's not to say the group catalog isn't good it's good right but i think even with the hype of what we got from the locks i thought we was probably expecting a little bit better out of their group catalog but you put together all of their work from what they've done as a group, individually, what each of them have done, whether it's been through the projects individually they've released, freestyles, mixtapes, solo, you no know, features, and everything else. They definitely have a top 20 group impact. Again, let's take all those things together. They have a top 20 group impact when you talk about all those things put together, right? And if nothing else, what the Versus did against Dipset, let everybody know that you can't discount them against anybody, right? We always talk about in basketball, okay. any series actually where you have seven games and, and anything, right? Matchups, styles make fights, right? Styles make yep. series. And no, what that was is stylistically, it was, a, it was not only just a bad matchup for Dipset, but when you underestimate your opponent, as I think Dipset did, and I think the public yes, did, it creates yes, a recipe for disaster of what can happen when you have a bad matchup. And yes, while Jada had the MVP performance of that versus, and rightfully so, and gets most of the credit, the group helped contribute to what that night was, right? Because it wasn't just Jada on there freestyling over who shot you and singing his verse from New York. That, that won that night for them. It's the understanding the critical mistake that Juels made about these niggas ain't got no songs for the ladies. Then from oh, the really? all the features of stuff and things that they've done over the years, that'd be like, we don't have things for the ladies? Are you kidding me? Is me? Like, With Mariah we Carey? Like, we don't have, like, we don't, we got Grammys. We don't have, <laughs> we got Grammys of stuff that we got for the ladies. What are you talking about? So, what you have with the locks is 25 years, a group that is put in a workman's effort, a group that is still together and no disputes, no riffs, no, just partnership, teamwork, 
and brotherhood as the way it's supposed to be. I don't know how many times I've seen them on the breakfast club or any other interview they've been on where they like, yo man, we we've been together for 25 years. We ain't never thought about broken up. Yeah. We're going to take some breaks. Jada, like I got to do what I got to do. Styles is going to do what I got to do. She is doing what he's doing. But when it comes down to it, we still going to come back together and we are going to be living off experience, the locks. That's what we're going to be. And 25 years, that's all it's been. I, not Nothing flashy, not spectacular, but they're a workman's group. They're going to show up to work and they're going to produce results. And if nothing else, you have to respect that. And, and when you got people that show up and, and produce results, even if they're not spectacular, you take that every day of the week and twice on Sunday rather than somebody who has a peak and then a valley and then a peak and then a valley. With them, it's just kind of been steady. Ooh. Their graph is very, very steady. It may not be at the height of some other groups, but it's been consistent. Because I like that a workman's group. I like how you refer to Red Man's workman's MC. Yeah, I like. I love that man. They personified man. You know what, man? The turtle beat the rabbit in the end because exactly. the, the, because they 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 they, they were slow and steady. You didn't see you can't you you watch a turtle move. That's gonna be some depressing shit. But I yeah. tell you what, you come back about two weeks, that damn turtle to moved a whole lot down that road. Exactly. But you watching at the time, like, man, he ain't doing shit. I'm going to go over here with, and with this rabbit. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hey, man, I love the fact that they stay together. The solidarity of those three guys, man. Much respect for Jada, you know, for, for, for Sheik and for, man, for Ghost, for South Street. Much love. Yeah. All right, Peacocks, before we get out of here, man, let's stop by Queens real quick. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to Queens. That was Yonkers. Let's go to Queens. And we out. QB had a dynamic duo. Now, you mm -hmm. know me and you, man. We love us some Nasir, man. We love us some Nasir, man. But this boy, these two boys right here, they can't, they were all kind of came up together, man. But these boys right here, and one of my favorite producers, low key, man, mm -hmm. of all time. Let's talk about Mob D, man. Rest in peace, the prodigy, of course. Yeah, Let's rest talk in about peace, man. Hey. Them boys, man, they gave me survival of the fittest, only the strong survive. Man, them boys gave us anthems, man. And yeah. and, 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 and 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 P had that prodigy had a voice that was so unique, man. And and, and when he spoke, you like that shit just hit you, bro. Yeah. And Havoc's beat, it was just the perfect symbiotic partnership. B Cox. Yeah. Let's lay it out for the boys, man. Mob deep, man. Mob deep. As I like to call them, the unlikeliest of pairings. And then also with the inauspicious start, man. Mob Deep start with that juvenile hell that came out was you talk to people and you'd be like, nah, Infamous is not their debut. It's juvenile hell, which came out in 1993. Mm -hmm. And it was an uh, unspectacular debut. And if you listen to that, you would never know what was coming two years afterwards and what they would become. Okay. What did it lead to? It led, as you mentioned, one of your favorite producers have it. Havoc becoming one of the best and probably most unique producers of his era. What the style, mind you, that helped lay the groundwork and foundation for one of the best collaborators, one of their best collaborators, who became one of the best producers of his era into this era, and none other than the Alchemist, right? Come on. Come on. Prodigy, as you mentioned, man, Come that on. voice who had a way with words, had a way of painting pictures that screamed out trife life, ghetto, gutter. Crime yes. lifestyle, like their music spoke to the streets. When you heard those music, it made you want to go out and do something. <laughs> you go out and whether it's you wanted to go out and try to rob somebody, somebody, you wanted to go out and try to act gangster, you wanted to get in the car and blast that survival of the fittest or an eye for mm -hmm. an eye or shook ones in the car, you know, at, at, at the highest volume that your car will allow. Their style was effective and it fit. Come that on, transformation bro. from the first album into the infamous was legendary. That three album run that we had from the infamous to hell on earth to murder music is now Woo! legendary. The infamous, <laughs> one of the best sophomore albums of the 90s, with classic songs, as you mentioned, those anthems that are now cultural staples. I knew it had arrived, man, when during a playoff series for the one game playoff for MLB a few years ago. What did they use? They used Survival of the Fittest as their as the song in the background. <laughs> boom, boom. Oh. <laughs> That's Hell, up. 
Oh. Hell on Earth, one of the most menacing, menacing sounding albums that ha- truly helped to establish them as power players, right? To me, somebody wrote a letter about this, probably one of the most, if you want to associate albums with seasons, probably one of the s- albums you would associate with the winter and cold weather more than anything else is Hell on Earth, right? Yes. And then Murder Music, which completed the journey from them being also Rans to being then eventually hip hop legends. Yeah, man. Put that into Havoc's other work that he did with other artists' projects. Prodigy then starting his solo run after Murder Music with HNIC, Return to the Mac, mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and other albums, Post Loud Records within their heyday, you know, only for it to end eventually with a couple other albums infamy and then the the g unit album which which to us was a little bit of a departure for them good 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 projects but nothing like of course we were used to of that excellence of that three album run then for prodigy to die and really for that to happen and knowing that we weren't going to get mob deep any longer which was is something that's a tragedy in itself so a very unlikely pairing but something when you want to talk about something that defined that period from let's say 1995 until the early 2000s even i would say 95 to 05 because you could take it from the infamous all the way into the alchemist first infantry right with the lead single with that being hold you down and just that sound that began to define what their style was which became signature for a lot of people became signature for queen and queensbridge you know helped to lay the foundation for a group that would follow or not even a couple of years afterwards at Capone and Noriega, Come which on, would man. be another occult hit. You know, that is what Mob Deep's legacy is, is being able to take a very, uh, a, a run and, and really make themselves legends as a result of the music they put out during that time. It wasn't for everybody. It wasn't. But, but when the people in the group and the fans, the niche that they locked into, made them probably a group that had as loyal as a following as people that as as groups that you'll run into nowadays that is just even now years after prodigy has passed away us stopping to think if they could have ever gotten this stuff back together and put out another album what it might have been like man so yeah mob deep um something you want to talk about menacing music street music hood music that's it that's what mob deep's legacy is it's music to ride to, music that you want to rob someone, music that you want to think about. Like, their music sounds like the struggle, right? And not just the struggle and what you're going through, it's about what you're willing to do to get out of it. Wow. Menacing music. Beacock, when you said, man, that's a, that song Survival of the Fittest, when you hear that, that bass line, that, mm, mm, man, it just make you want to go do something. And you ain't lying. Now, what that something is, you, the individual had to fill that in. But you felt you couldn't sit still. Your ass was going to get out the house and go do something. So, yeah, 100%, 100% brother. Wells, man, again, man, rest in peace, man, to, to Prodigy. Rest in peace man. to P, man, yeah. Rest in peace to P. Phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal delineate, de- de- delineation of that, Beacox, as always. All right, man. We got to catch a flight. Last time I took to my hometown, they was really happy, man. They 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 said, can you bring Beacox back to the shot? I said, hey, of course I got to bring my D.C. brother back so I get him some Harrow's. I can get him That's some Giordano's. Yeah, so I get him Giordano's pizza. Yes, I got to get my boy straight. Beacox, you and me on your show. And shout out, make sure you guys are all following the Vault Classic Music Review if you have not. And, of course, all his links are always in all of them. Our uh, collabos, every everyone. Make sure you guys. This next individual, this young lady, because you, we, we did a review of an album on her. My hometown, first one from my city to go plat. <laughs> I know, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's give this lady her flowers, and let's talk about how she man. So she actually ran. She actually, let me, let me just say that she actually walked so these other girls today can run and they can take, and they took, they can take the game to a whole nother level, man. But she oh, gets yeah. left out when it comes to the Mount Rushmore of female MCs and contributions to the game. Ten people tend to forget her, you know, for various reasons that my brother B. Cox will explain far better than I can. Yeah. Let's talk about the brat, her legacy yeah. and impact 
in hip hop. Yeah, man. I mean, we said it a lot on that episode of the vault, man, which you did a great job of giving us a shot town perspective, man, because that's important. I love to get the hometown perspective of somebody who first dropped, man. But as you mentioned with the brat, first female MC to go platinum, which is important. Look at all the people who came before her that didn't go platinum that were exceptional. The Moni Loves, the Queen Latifahs, the Roxanne Shantae's, the MC Lights. None of them went platinum before the brat. She really, I would say, helped to usher in a new breed of female MCs. And she was different in the fact that she wasn't conscious like the ones that I named before. Um, and it wasn't as people who would come after her wasn't all about the image and sex appeal about with her either. Now we saw it a little bit later on with her. We were like, know, Damn. right around <laughs> unrestricted, you know, unrestricted era when she decided to, you know, fem it up a little bit. And we saw a different side of her, you know, we were able to see, like, damn, this is just shit. All right, okay. All right, you know? okay. All right. But, but it always came down to with the brat is that. One, she had a perfect parent with being together with somebody like Jermaine Dupree and so, so come on, deaf, man. Come on, come on. Really come on. tapping into those roots of being uh, those that funk and that soul revival that was happening and sampling that started around that era in hip hop. But then her lyrics is what set her apart and still set her apart from so many other M- female MCs during that era. And then afterwards, she really did help to set a new standard when it came to getting busy on the mic as a female really her legacy is that she could roll with the big boys lyrically when she stepped on the track you know with her male counterparts on the track and she was as rugged as some of them on the track talking that shit as well but say you know you know and so she helped to do that and and she stayed true to that for a good period of time and when she would jump on tracks with other other female MCs there was no comparison whatsoever skill wise she was leaps and bounds ahead of uh, so most everyone, if not everyone she jumped on a track with. And when That's she jumped fact. on the track, you noticed her immediately. Come on. You want to talk about unique voices? The Come brat on. had a unique voice and a unique flow, a unique style. And when she came on it, she came on it hard, right? Oh. She did. You knew when she arrived on a record. And that's what you want from somebody that had the style that she did. And uh, being able to go platinum, especially like you said, first from your city, first female rapper to go platinum, um, to have some hit records and some big, big records during that summer with Functify Drop Man, um, and then be able to take that and put that into a career and carry that career out. But really, as you said, help to lay the groundwork afterwards. There's a ground, there's the groundwork there as she goes platinum, and then Lil Kim comes out a year, two years later. And drops her album, which ends up going platinum. Ill Foxy Brown with Ill Na Na, that goes platinum. Lauren Hill goes platinum. You know, Eve goes platinum. Eve, oh, come on, B Cox, talk is let them know. You know. That's the legacy that she helped to open up the doors. People will say, eh, you know, for, yeah, if you know rappers, they might be a little bit of a niche, but they're they gonna sell some records, but it's not gonna be enough to right. sell on the same of these, these male rappers that are up during that time. She did that. And she did it because people respected her style. Like, yo, she she on hand, she getting busy, man. And so props to the brat, props to her putting it down for the shy, um, putting it down for so so deaf and helping to make them not just the label, you know, that that at one point in time just had, you know, Chris Cross and a couple other acts and had some RB acts. They eventually became a major player as well. And she was really at the at the, the forefront of that. I mean. I don't want to say she, she didn't make Jermaine Dupree, but what she did is she helped to give JD um, the ability to know that, damn, this dude produced his first female rapper that went platinum. That's credibility right there. If you can do that as a producer and as an executive producer, that's working with something, right? That's being able to work with something. And those two became quite the duo on some things for years to come. They had a great pairing and a great working relationship. So you got to Give your props, not just to the brat man, but also to JD and so, so deaf for giving her the opportunity to get out there and be the first to do it. B. Cox, really briefly, we don't have to stay here long. And this again, but since you mentioned him, does, does JD get his credit he deserves, man, you feel, in the game? I don't I don't think he does now. Okay. Um, I feel as though um, – because his output and work hasn't been as frequent these last this last decade and a half 
Yeah. Um, JD's been involved with some things. He's kind of been involved, like, you know, producing some movies and doing other entertainment things. But uh, look, man, for a while, man, JD was prolific. Yeah. When it came to his output, man. Very prolific. He was, and he was a bad boy. We got to understand, man. JD's been in the game for a while. As a kid, when he was a backup dancer and doing promoting, you know, doing promotions and then eventually settling down in the studio, JD worked with a lot of people in Atlanta, man. He, along with a lot of others, if we talk about the beginning of the Atlanta hip hop scene blowing up, along with organized noise, along with outcast, those early Atlanta acts, man, JD is right there with it. He doesn't get the props that he deserves. And I think he needs to receive that. We talk about getting hip hop honors. BET needs to be looking at giving one to Jermaine Dupree for the work that he's done too, as well, man. He needs it. I think he needs it. I agree. Well said, because his pen game, man, people forget how. How nasty his pen game but he bet the boy wrote hits for some of everybody oh yeah hey yeah hey in that time if it wasn't from robert kelly you couldn't go wrong with jd giving you a hit either man i mean either one of them boys jd could pin you a damn hit man jd mm -hmm. hey so yeah much respect and shout out to jd okay yeah. b cox last let we about to lead the midwest man but i would be remiss if i didn't mention these brothers man Again, another episode I was blessed to be on the vault, and you did another breakdown on their first album. But this mm -hmm. time, because we want to talk about them from a, you know the catalog from a holistic standpoint, because man, when they came out, mm -hmm. I don't know what the fuck that was. Yeah, you talk about a tectonic shift in hip hop. Yeah, and I'm in Chicago in the home of City of Twister, and you know I, I'm used to. The, 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 but when I heard these boys, I said, what the fuck is, who, where are they from? Yeah. Talks, let's talk about the crown jewel of the Midwest, as I call it. Mm-hmm. Found by the legendary, great Eric Wright, Easy e who you did a great job of breaking down his career and impact. Mm -hmm. Go check that out if you haven't seen it. Because did a phenomenal job talking about Eric Wright. Let's talk about Bone Thugs and Harmony coming out mm -hmm. of Cleveland, Ohio. The jewel yeah. of the Midwest. Because. Yeah. I mean, we said it there in our review, man. Um, when they came out, it, it was the style, the, the flow, the music, the image really is what the whole package is really what was the tectonic shift. Mm -hmm. It was that flow, that first, you know, Ooh. single that came out dropping with Douglas Ruggish Bone, but it was the, oh, damn, these niggas coming out with these corn rolls. They have you know, in some of these videos, they're wearing these fatigues and these sports jerseys and these Gore-Tex jackets and and all that, right? Then it was the 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 flow, the stylization, the way that the music made you feel, their style helped to inspire styles. And I could say, because their music came out, when their music came out, I was in middle school, man. Okay. So when they dropped that summer, I'm starting middle school and I see everything change about the guys, the boys in my school, the way that a lot of them dressed, it changed a lot of them the way they did their hair. Mm -hmm. It changed the demeanor, everything. That's influence. And if that was happening there where I was at, right outside of D.C., I know that was happening in places in the Midwest. Absolutely. Had to be happening in places out west. Had to be placed happening in places in the southwest and on the third coast because they were big. And the fact that they were this group that all had this style that with that rapid flow and uh, the music, which was expertly produced by DJ Yella and DJ Unique, okay. which had some West Coast overtones to it. Yes, but sir. The style was uniquely Midwest. And they let people know that they were from Cleveland and that was and and they were damn proud of it as well. And right. we got introduced to other people from the Midwest. Because of Bone, let's keep it a buck. Not those y'all from the Midwest. Are you from Chicago or you from Kansas City or you from St. Louis or you from Detroit? You'll be like, oh, we always been here. Yeah, we know you've always been there. Yeah, but we know. From the perspective of somebody who's not there. Come on, Beacock. So Bone, it, Bone introduced us to them and they introduced us and made us want to look at what else was out there in this part of the country that nobody was paying attention to up until that point. You really. better say it. You know? Oh, Bones rapping like this? Who else rapping like this out here in the Midwest? This guy out there named Twister? He he Ooh. rapping like that too? Does he rap faster than them? Oh, then all of a sudden you see these other groups starting to come out. Another group from the shot. Crucial, crucial Conflict dropping. Uh, 
Oh, you know, stylistically, almost like a bo like bone clones, as I like to call them, right? <laughs> and, I even them. Bone and no disrespect to them, but I mean, honestly, that's what it seemed like to me and everybody else who was watching from our perspective of where we was from in DC. They, they, okay. Them niggas seemed like they was bone clones, right? Then, then you have do or die, you know? Then people start finding out about Tech Nine. You know, so the the Pandora's box opens up in the Midwest because of Bone Thugs and Harmony, right? Okay. And right. take it even a step further and go down to the Mid South because of the rift that they had, this thing they had between them and Three Six Mafia. So the influence ends up spanning well even beyond just what you would consider to be traditional Midwest. It goes even further than that. So Bone drops these albums. Then individually, they start dropping projects. Then they all reunite again for another album right around the end of the century. And by the time you get into the new millennium, they're established as hip-hop superstars. You know, a rarity in hip-hop where stylistically they had this style and they were dominating the charts. Let's, let's not forget that. That these songs like Douglas Ruggish Bone and Ooh. For the Love of Money and... Ooh. Rose in East 1999 and Look Into My Eyes and Days of My Lives, stuff that they dropped on the soundtracks were songs and videos that people were into. Everybody out there who remembers the box, man, music videos, you control, you call in, dial oh, up yeah. the number, get you with oh, them. Yeah. Bones videos were always at the top. Not just Crossroads, which everybody remembers, but they videos were always, always. the most requested videos out there. You don't gain popularity out, out there unless people mess with what it is that you have. So their influence really is, is that, man, they, they opened up the Midwest, I would say, for us to be able to discover not just what they have, but then what other people just tried to then duplicate afterwards. Then also for people to see, oh, there's other stuff over here that's good as well. And what did I say? The, the do or dies, the crucial conflicts, the Twist. technology, the twisters. It gave us an entryway into other artists out there that also existed for a while. And then we saw that the style was uniquely and very much uh, Midwest. And that's what helped to open up that whole other part of the body. The, just like the South, when the South really first jumped out there for the very first time, whether it was Two Live Crew or Outcast or Ghetto Boys or Scarface, you know, eventually down to Cash Money and or to uh, to no limit, it opened up another universe for us that we didn't even think that existed. It's like playing a video game and you unlock the locking a new level of somewhere you've never been before, and it's like, oh, there's a bunch of stuff over here I didn't even know was here. You know, that's what that did. Wow, Cox, I know you're telling them you, you're spot on because being there, man. One thing about and you know, whenever you're from a region that tends to be, I don't know, man, tends to be, you know, when it comes to hip hip hop and contribution sometimes the midwest is forgotten you know because hey you know i mean we just we just work even mm -hmm. though we listen to everything and being from the midwest you listen to the southern yeah. music the western music the east mm -hmm. yeah everything everything but yeah. when somebody from that region pops man it's a certain pride because it's like yeah god damn it we've been dope see i told y'all we've been dope and so Hell yeah. Bone is always, man, they're they're near and dear to me because that was around the time I was really outside and I was going into the military and I was like, yeah, you see, see, you see, nigga, you see how we get down to Midwest, nigga? It didn't matter if it was Cleveland, I'm from Chicago. It's the Midwest. Midwest, and, man. Yeah. And and as a region, man, we were so proud, man. So I'll yeah. always appreciate those brothers, man. And that mm -hmm. music made you want to go hustle too. That man, for the love of money. Yeah. That was the hustling music, man. That was hustling music, man. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, man. So yeah, it definitely was. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, hey, guys, go check out the review again on the Vault Classic. Myself and B Cox, that was a phenomenal episode. We really did a great job, man, of uh, breaking down Crippin' on the come up. Mm -hmm. But uh, y'all know what B Cox do, man. He put the sauce on it, man. All right, B Cox, let's get out to Midwest, man. I know we got to get down south because I had a lot of people. They had some itch. They. I, we we gave one man his cigars, and I got somebody else DMing me about another rap label. I said, well, God, dog, and we, I can't get everybody their cigars in one episode. Can't please uh, everybody. <laughs> can't please everybody. Yeah. Me and you gave Master P his credit for yeah. New Orleans, and I got a bunch of, but wait a minute. Hold on. Yeah. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. i tell you what. I said, we're going to talk about this shit today. Yeah. 
the one thing I do respect about these guys, it's another group, another group, another label. They didn't really venture out too much and get into too many things. They stayed, they, they stayed true to the music. Mm-hmm. They found a formula that worked for them. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to selling records, I don't think nobody in hip hop had probably has sold more records with them. I'm I'm I, I they the baby brags about it. It obviously may be true. But I will always say this, man. They brought in a different sound. And when it comes to that bling, bling, opulence to another level, man, the number one stunner. Yeah. Baby, cash yeah. money, them boys. Yeah. They took floss into a level. We had never seen that shit before. Oh, yeah. Peacock, let's talk about the legacy of cash money records with Baby and Slim. And then we're going to get to something controversial. That's current, but we'll get there in a minute. Yeah. Right. Go ahead. I mean, talk about stealing people's thunder. And I'm talking about cash money out of New Orleans. Um, they're emerging nationally at the same time that really when P and No Limit on the mist, they they burnt their heater run in yes, 90, from 96 into 98. Yes, right. Sir. When you think in New Orleans, this is what we got. Oh, no limit is running New Orleans. You know, you got P down here with no limit. He got Silk the Shocker, he has True, C Murder, you got Fiend, you got Mac, you got Mercedes, you got <laughs> Mia X, you have oh, Soldier cool. Slim, all cool. these guys out here that are prolific in their output, as we talked about last time. Well, right around that time, Cash Money breaks out, and Baby and Slim, they have been grinding down there for a long time, man. Businessmen a lot like P. Now, they weren't hustling like P you know, out the trunk, like the way P was at West Coast back down in New Orleans or nothing. But what they did, like you said, planted their flag right down there in the Big Easy, and they locked things down. Come on. Now, when Juvenile first dropped and he came out with 400 degrees in 98, <laughs> he dropped that high, right? That became an anthem for not just New Orleans and Magnolia and, and like... That shit had everybody, even where I was from, man. We we are well in DC, man. We are partial to down south artists, but when that shit dropped, and then when you had to follow that up with big timers, and then eventually BG, and then we're introduced then to Turk, and then none other than Lil Wayne Tunchi himself, Lil Wayne being introduced to this, and the hot boys putting out their project with Wayne being the baby of the group. Literally at that time, dropping his debut album right there in '99, and the architect and the sound which gave Cash Money its unique sound. We talk about the uh, Beach by the Pound and Medicine Man doing what they did for No Limit. Let's talk about Manny, but Manny talk Fresh, Manny. come on, Beacock, talk about Manny. Manny Fresh and his beats are the sound of New Orleans hip hop, unquestionably the sound of New Orleans hip hop. When you hear those cash money beats, Go Manny on. got so damn hot that after a while, people was like, hold on. Uh, you, you got any more of that? You know, Manny was pumping out some heaters because they understood to know what it made to make New Orleans move. And when you made New Orleans move, other people moved along with it. Come on, so when you had these club bangers coming out and they pushing out this product. That makes the streets move, makes the club move, make the ladies move, and make niggas want to get gangster. <laughs> it was a perfect formula. <laughs> and to be honest, once Cash Money started getting going, Come on, he and No Limit, I mean, they took a little bit of a step back. And back. if you were there in the moment, you'll understand and know what I'm saying. They didn't fall off completely, but when Cash Money stepped out, Starting from 98 all the way heading into the new millennium. No Limit took a little bit of a backseat in New Orleans. You know, a lot of this is also based, you know, area-wise, different wards, who mess with who. But Cash Money, when they made that stamp, because this is right around the time I'm getting I'm getting ready to finish up high school, man. Okay. okay. Heading into college. This okay. Cash Money music became a soundtrack, man, for the club. It became a soundtrack for your ride. And they had, they didn't have the roster that No Limit had. No. But the acts that they had, they put things out. And all that stuff is, oh, when you talk about regional classics and regional legends, that's what they were at that time. But then nationally, it had some cachet. So you take that, Hot Boys together doing their thing. 
Juve doing his thing. You know, you have BG. He was there. He got into some problems. He separates Turk doing his thing out there. That's somebody that doesn't get talked about enough. I you know, agree. Manny is producing for everybody. And then on the on the cusp here, you got this guy Wayne emerging mm-hmm. that people see and know that there's something mm-hmm. a little bit special about him, and that something's going to come eventually. Mm-hmm. He was just he was just waiting for the right moment to be able to explode and do something. Mm-hmm. And and cash money leads to the development, what eventually then becomes young money. And we already know what young money did and what it meant to a certain period right after that. But it leads to the point to getting Wayne to where the point where he was, uh, you know, post Jay-Z retirement to him being what he was. So the, the legacy and what cash money did, man, is that they took really the spotlight. I would say even from no limit in them and really took the forefront in new Orleans and they took it and ran with it. And, you know, th- that was something that it was amazing to see. Like you said, the opulence, the bling bling, the, the you know, the the album covers with the way they were designed, the music videos. And then music videos were all in the hood. It was all New Orleans stuff. You were saying stuff, you know, <laughs> Seventh War, Ninth War, like Fifth War. You were seeing all that in their videos. They kept it a buck, too. You know, yeah, you saw the stunners and the, the cars and the, the rams and stuff like that. But then you also see some shit in the hood and some shit that you only see down in New Orleans. You know, things that were unique to that area, they really did put on for their city. And nationally, people got onto it and they gravitated towards it even more than I would even say they did so with no limit. Really. Mm. You know, mm. not a big roster, but the roster they had was efficient. They were an efficient roster, and they put out music that people gravitated towards, man. They got on to it, and they held on to it. Wow. Because the thing with them, and I, I think that's a classic case, I think Pete, when Pete tried to diversify himself, and he started doing so many different things, he took his eyes off the music, they stayed true. That's the, that's the true uh, 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 definition of, you know what, man, mastering something and staying with it and, man, making that shit pay dividends. And that's why, to your point, the, the longevity, the staying power, people still want a hot boy for reunion to this day. Oh, they yeah. still yeah. want one. Yeah. They still want one, man. Yeah. And those artists are still relevant, man. All yeah. of them boys are relevant. And they got a heart, you know, just opposed to No Limit, where you really like outside of Snoop, if you really ain't got nothing really there. Nobody, you know, no, no limit artists that people really clamoring for, man. Mr. Yeah. in jail. So, yeah, man, I got to give my hat to, to, to baby because when I think of them, I think of cash. I think of baby and slim straight hustlers and boys oh, wasn't, wasn't giving nothing out the mud. Go get it. Yeah. Hey, ain't yeah. no record stores down here. We're going to get this shit the hard way. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, record uh, com- uh, companies down here, they got theirs the hard way, man. Much respect. And they kept it New Orleans. Yeah. It, it deviate. Now, because right in there, man, and me and Dama, we had polarizing, you know, we were, you know, we we, we, we were just opposed on opposite ends of this one. Last time on my, on my show, Purple Panties. And we, I feel Luane should be performing, headlining at, at the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Because how can you go to New Orleans with that type of roster, mm-hmm. with that type of line, with all of those songs, and you don't let this man headline the Super Bowl? So what is your take on that? And why do you think, in your opinion, that Lil Wayne may have not gotten the call? No disrespect to us, Kendrick. We love Kendrick. Yeah. Happy, happy for him. Yeah, strictly talking about Little Wayne. Yeah, Wait. I mean, to be honest, why can't you? I mean, to uh, be honest, it's does Wayne has some great music, right? But does he have the right type of music that you want to have on a Super Bowl halftime show? You know, despite the fact that he's from New Orleans, despite the fact that he's the biggest artist from New Orleans, no if ands or buts about it, hands that hands down, you know, bigger than P, bigger than anybody from Cash Money. He is the biggest hip hop artist from New Orleans. Yes, he is. But if you start looking at it and look at eh, how many of his that songs can he do during Super Bowl weekend? And mind you, Super Bowl is the most watched program in America, right? No matter what, no more people watch Super Bowl than they watch. Take the next five other programs, then they watch all those combined, right? This is a global event. Correct. <sighs> 
does Wayne have the catalog that can put together a Super Bowl halftime show that will be aesthetically pleasing to the rest and performance wise recently can he can he put something together that will allow it to be acceptable for it being halftime at the Super Bowl now I don't doubt the fact that he doesn't he has bangers yes he does but I think recently what's been happening is that man Wayne looks a little bit like a mess man I mean he does you know for him to be I think me and Wayne are about the same age he he looks a little beat up and then we know why that is obviously man you yeah. been you know, yeah, substance living abuse. a hard life, substance abuse, and things like that. Wayne's also said a lot of controversial stuff over the last few years, man, in regards to who he supports politically, his stance on the people, black and stuff like. So all that stuff sort of adds into the reason why it's it's he was maybe not selected versus somebody like Kendrick. Now I understand the cachet. It's New Orleans. Why don't you have Wayne performing if you're going to pick a rapper to perform for halftime, right? But we go back and look at all the different places where people performed in the Super Bowl. You know, they were in Atlanta. Maroon Five was on the Super Bowl, was on the halftime what show. What the fuck man. was that shit about? But yeah, yeah I remember that. Yeah. Boy and Sleepy Brown showed up and did a couple of a couple of songs, but they weren't headlining. Um, the Super Bowl was in Houston. Was anybody clamoring for Scarface to be the be the you know, <laughs> or Slim Thug or Paul Wall to be the person that was actually headlining the Super Bowl? No, no, sir. So uh, I don't understand what the big deal is, the fact that Wayne wasn't selected. Now, Wayne can perform. Back in his days, he was probably a better performer. Is he going to be able to give the same type of performance that Kendrick can, seeing as though what Kendrick has done over these last... Let's look over the last decade, right? Okay. What has Wayne's output been versus what Kendrick's output has been? Not the same. Everything, you know, it's not the same. When people say, well, oh, Usher hasn't been to the face. Yeah, but Usher has a catalog of hits that can fill up two Super Bowl halftimes. Right, two Super Bowl half times. So I get it. People, people want to make this thing, and you know the Wayne's gallery, like you know the Nickies and the other folks that want to talk shit about, you know, oh, this is. Listen, man, he wasn't selected for it, I, and I'm okay with it. You know, hell, you, the hometown artist does not have to perform the Super Bowl every Super Bowl. We have to just understand. Last time the Super Bowl was in New Orleans, Beyonce was a halftime act, man. She's from Houston. She's from Third Coast. She's from Houston. So, so I can understand why people may be upset, but honestly, I don't think it's really that big of a deal. You know, now if he brought Wayne out, I wouldn't. I would find that appropriate, right? I, if I hope brought Wayne out, I would find that appropriate. But headlining, I'm not really that that upset about it, to be quite honest. Okay. Nah. All right, because. All right, because we're in Louisiana, man. Let's let's just step over to Texas really quick because again, I had some some people say y'all got to talk about this group next time. Y'all got to talk about one of the legendary personalities um in hip hop that still, man, his his voice, his production, his rap tunes, all of who he was, man. His flavor, his charisma, it still lives on in perpetuity, man. Let's talk about UGK, Pimp C, and Bun B really briefly, man. We don't have to stay here long because we got a lot of work to do in Atlanta, man. But yeah. let's talk about UGK. Well, I mean, it's, you, you know, and listen, man, they they helped to define, just like Cash Money did, they helped to define a, a region sound, right? Mm-hmm. They did from the very beginning with, you know, with Super Tight and, and their, day, their albums that, before they even dropped off and dropped off right and dirty, which was in 96. They helped to divine really, man, that sound of Houston, along with ghetto boys and along with Scarface, um, along with other, you know, legends like Lil Kiki um, and, uh, you know, other rap a lot acts during that time, Devin to do, they helped to define a sound of that third coast into Texas. And, and, you know, they did it, man. And this is another group that has stayed true to who they were. Um, production wise, um, you know, a lot of the work that Pimp C did, the things that they, he basically did is he self taught himself in those legendary UGK tracks. The juxtaposition that you had and dichotomy mm-hmm. between Pimp C and Bum mm-hmm. B, the way that they complemented each other so well, mm-hmm. differences in their voice, differences in their flows. I mean, 
legendary output really you know from what they did i mean w- when you see from the beginning of it from super tight all the way out to underground kings or right before pimp c himself passed away it really was something again not really straying very far away from the formula but but damn they put it down and they another group that got the respect of everyone and all of their contemporaries respected the hell out of them for the route that they took and how they got it out of the mud as well. Um, you want to talk about being underappreciated. Um, I don't think a lot of people, man, looking at UGK with riding dirty and dirty money, man, how many people, you know, the, the influence that they had on that whole region of Houston, Port Arthur, what they did on so many people that were coming out of that, that region, man. Um, and what you helped to create, I mean, to put it like this, um, when they're at, at really at, at the point where they're becoming big, right after Dirty Money, and they also get their experience, their exposure by Pimp C being on sipping on some scissor with Three Six Mafia, right? Woo-hoo! You know, Pimp C goes to jail. Bum B continues doing his thing and yeah. puts out some bangers and solo albums. <laughs> but make sure to let people know that he was riding for his man until he got out of prison, and then yes, when he sir. got out of prison, they picked right back up where they left off as if they never skipped a beat. You better say and it. Then, and then for them to drop that last album with Underground Kings, man, which I'm telling you, man, when that joint dropped that summer, I remember because I was working, um, I was actually working at Enterprise, Enterprise Rent a Car that summer. And okay. I remember right. like that was my that was my joint. That first disc was that was my soundtrack going to and from work every single day, man. Wow. And it was like, man, I, I love these dudes, man. The fact that it was uniquely Houston, uniquely Southeast Texas. It was it was a style that everybody in the in the area and in the region could identify with. They didn't stray away from what their formula was. And um, they kept it trill, as they said, man. You know, they kept it trill. They were true to themselves. Pimp C, one of the most unique characters that you would see in hip hop, spoke his mind, said what the hell was on his mind. It was never about no sucker shit, as he always said. And you got to appreciate that about him. And then what Bum B did in his absence, both when he was locked up and now after his, before after his untimely death, was continue to keep the UGK legacy alive by letting people know that they're here to stay about what they had. He's continuing that continuing that legacy on, and um, you know you have to respect that man. Uh, again, not a group that was very big mainstream wise. They had their their blips with the features the. Three Six Mafia, the Outcast, uh, then they were big, big hits. You know, they were big hits when they did show up on the radar nationally. They yeah. made an impact. Big they Pimpin, Jay Z, Big Pimpin, Pimpin. Pimpin. yeah, Jay Z. They made a huge impact when they jumped on the scene nationally. So the one thing I always think about when I think about UGK is that man, had they been able to carry that and sustain that that impact nationally and carried that out over a longer period of time. But then again, that wasn't what it was about with no. them, you know, just like we talk about with the locks. It was about showing up and doing work, man, and, work. and making sure that they stay true to themselves. And that's what UGK's legacy is. And not only that, man, they gave the rest of that region a blueprint to follow. And it gave you talk about soundtracks of a region, soundtracks of an area. Oh, yeah, that was UGK. That was UGK. that area in Texas, man. That was UGK in that area there in Texas made just real good rider down home music you know what i'm saying that folks from that area could relate to and the rest of us man those of us who appreciated stuff like that grabbed onto and held onto that as well man so props to them and rest in peace to pimp c as always definitely rest in peace to pimp c and b cox man the thing with you know with pimp c it was his authenticity that appealed to me man is is his personality his, you know, just being bold and unapologetically myself. And I, I, I always dug that. Plus, he was a light skinned nigga. I always gonna pull for the light skinned nigga. <laughs> hey, as your man Damu say, beige rage, you got there right. We're gonna stick together, goddammit. That motherfucker, that motherfucker crazy. I said, I said, kiss my ass. I, I, I ride with my, with my light skinned homies. Hey, pimp, man. pimp was one of a kind, man. And, and Bun lyrically, man, is nasty. Yeah. Nasty and people don't they didn't uh, until unless Bun slip up and get on a track, you're like, God dang, well, I forgot Bun will come through and slice your ass up, man. Yeah, but as you said, it was never about that. And you, you talk about what 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 Bone did for our Midwest, 
to me, UGK did that for Texas. Now, mm. of course, you know, we you already know how much we love Face. We gave Face his cigars last time. But mm. UGK got me to – Pimp C got me to start paying attention to the Slim Thugs, to the Swisher Houses, and yeah. all those guys, Paul Wall, Mike Jones, and all them boys. So, yeah, again, UGK kicked in the doors, man, and really made me say, hey, what else is around here y'all boys got in Texas, man? So yeah, I'm man. always – appreciate ugk man Most identity people. it was an identity man and like you said and that's that's uh, that is evident on that draped up remix that bum b Ooh. had where Ooh. you had all the houston heavy hitters on there the little kikis the little slim kikis. Tuck, the ball, all the zeros the flips you know, little flip, you know all that and then you you know seeing guys like trade the truth seeing all of that stuff swisher house all these people coming out right you know what i'm saying it was an identity yes Space from Houston and rap Houston to the day he died. But UGK's music identified with Houston and that region of Texas, bro. That was identity. That's what that was. It was identity. Yeah, because Face was more, to me, it, Face could have been from Chicago had I not known better. Yeah, it, He yeah. could have been from D.C. had you not known yeah, better. Man. Yeah. But you knew UGK was from Texas. They wanted yeah. you to know that. They put emphasis on it. I like how you said that, Beacock. It was an identity. They wanted you to know we were country rap tunes. Yeah, this ain't this ain't no hip hop. <laughs> this ain't no hip hop, nigga. This country rap tunes. <laughs> I said, all right, Phil C, got it, got that. Yeah, much love. All right, Beacocks, let's get back to the city, man, where I reside at, man. 